Thank you, Jennifer, for inviting me to be here this evening. I'm really glad to uh, be a part of this group and uh, love to talk about small-scale agriculture and livestock production on a small farm. So here are the topics we'll try to cover tonight uh, as best we can. Um, why have animals in the first place? What would be the goal in doing so? And what resources, both in time and money, will be needed to support that effort? What are the needs of different types of animals? Because, um, you know, all, all different species have different needs. So you have to be able to cater to them and care for them well according to their needs in order to have success. And finally, what is your land's capability to support and or maintain them? Um, do you have a lot of land? Do you have uh, just a small acreage? Do you have barns of, to house them in in bad weather? etc. So why raise livestock? Well, first of all, if you have kids on the farm, uh, it's a great project for kids to uh, and can even turn into a 4-H project. And in that process of taking care of animals, they learn a lot of life's lessons. Uh, they gain some responsibility having to take care of them. They learn how to do uh, proper care, provide good animal welfare, and they're gaining some skills while they do that. It seems like farm kids can really grow up with a lot of confidence and knowledge um, that others just don't have just simply by uh, working hard on the farm and, and learning to take care of animals in the proper way. They also learn about the natural cycles of birth to death. Unfortunately, no matter how well you take care of animals, you will lose them from time to time. And, uh, and then also just learning where food comes from, meat, milk, eggs, all of those different things. I mean, kids grow up in the city thinking that food comes from the grocery store, which it does, but it also comes from somewhere else before that. So some of the benefits of owning animals on a, on a farm, big or small, is that they're uh, great for grazing on land that is not good for row crops. And we have a lot of land in the upper Midwest that is not really suitable for continuous row cropping. And um, I wish that uh, more and more of it actually was put into pasture and raising livestock because um, it would just be, I think, a lot better for the environment all the way around if we reduced some of the erosion that happens on hillsides through continuous farming. Uh, you know, a lot of the uh, species are, that forage are great for weed and brush control, and they all provide fertilizer for the soil. And finally, there is extra income for the farm. Uh, Well-managed livestock can be profitable. And that's, uh, I should highlight, well-managed, because that's an important element of it. You can also lose your shirt in livestock if you aren't careful. So some of the challenges of owning animals is that it can be time consuming, um, you know, extra labor compared to row cropping. Uh, with row crops, you have spring and fall uh, as a time when you're really busy and then there's a lot of slack time. Not so with livestock. Well, yes and no. Um, there can be downtime as well, different times of the year that livestock um, are easier to take care of. Let me put it that way. But also, of course, during the uh, uh, period of birthing, that's a period when there's a lot of intense activity going on and you're going to be putting in a lot of labor during that time. Um, as Jennifer and I were talking when we first uh, got on online, we were talking about the difficulty of finding caregivers during a time of need. And that's, uh, that actually has become really important, became really important during the COVID outbreak what to do if you have, um, you know, somebody who is sick for a long time on the farm, who do you find to take care of your animals and do things the way you really hope they're going to be done? And actually, Extension developed a whole series of uh, contingency uh, worksheets for what to do on a dairy farm or a beef farm or a pig farm or a sheep farm. And those are available on the Extension website. And this would be where you uh, connect with somebody that you know and trust, and you sit down with them and go into detail on this sheet of paper 
about what, how you would like things done if you were sick or if you take a vacation, that kind of thing. Um, livestock can be an expensive hobby if you are wanting it to be just a hobby. Um, for example, a lot of people enjoy raising chickens in urban areas, and uh, consequently, they, they do so as a hobby. Um, but they enjoy getting the eggs from the birds. They're expensive, but uh, the birds add other elements to their experience as well. So it's all part of having a hobby. Uh, they can be expensive entertainment, certainly. Uh, then there's always the issue of losing um, livestock, uh, you know, both in bad weather and with predation. predation. That can happen with all species, some more than others. Certainly with chickens out on the landscape, you can lose a lot of birds to predators and bad weather, um, or little pigs, little lambs and goats. They can all be um, subject to predation. Oh, and as I mentioned earlier, there's periods of, of intense labor, especially during the uh, birthing season. And then finally, you have to learn how to work around animals um, in such a way that, you know, you are uh, careful, protective of yourself, because they can be dangerous at times. And um, there are potential liability issues with that. If somebody was working on your farm and got hurt by um, not even a bull necessarily, but sows during the time of uh, when they have little pigs around, they can be really feisty. Or a sheep, um, um, a male sheep is a ram and a male goat is a buck. And you never want to turn your back to them because they might just decide to use you as a target. So you want to be careful around them. So which livestock species to raise? Uh, you know, this is a basic starting point. Uh, what are you going to do? And of course, it has to be something that you really like. If you don't enjoy it, it doesn't matter. It won't go well. But it, it um, should be something that you like and enjoy and then fits well with, with your particular operation. So ruminants um, are these animals that are commonly raised in uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and around the country. The first three certainly more than others, cattle, sheep, and goats. Uh, buffalo are being raised to some extent now more and more, and then deer and elk. But deer and elk both have their own issues, as we know, with uh, chronic wasting disease. And so they, they are actually, I think, declining in popularity, which is, and it's too bad because elk in particular is such good eating. But with cattle, sheep, and goats, of course, you can have, uh, uh, with cattle, beef or dairy, with sheep, meat, dairy, and fiber, and goats, the same, meat, dairy, and fiber. So there's a lot of alternatives or a lot of potential revenue streams, depending on, uh, you know, what your thoughts are about this, about what you'd like to pursue. On ruminants, um, animals that don't have a multi-stomach digestive system need a balanced feed, not just forage. They simply will not do well just on their own foraging on the landscape. So that includes pigs, chickens, turkeys, um, uh, and in chickens, both broilers and layers, ducks, geese, rabbits, all of these animals, if you're going to raise them, they need a balanced feed ration in order to not only survive, but to thrive. So even if they're out on the landscape, even if they're out in the field, you've got to supplement, not supplement, you have to provide feed for them or they will not, they will not thrive. Um, so if you were to consider this as a business enterprise, it's important ultimately to think about the marketing aspect of it. Uh, where will I sell meat or eggs or milk or the, uh, the live animals? Uh, to whom? Um, what, what am I going to do with the finished product? And with some of these, you have to think about that. Uh, really quickly because they grow fast and they're ready to go out the door. And so what do you do? You've got to get them, uh, get them sold. So do you go to an auction barn or direct to customers? 
What infrastructure do you need to make this happen? Um, and which of these all might generate more profit or faster turnover? These are all things that you really need to consider, especially if you're thinking about the business aspect of it. Um, certainly, if you look at direct marketing, for example, direct marketing can um, help you gain more of the total net value of the animal at the retail level. There's also more work involved in it. Uh, at the same time, with uh, direct marketing, um, you know, there's just, uh, well, as I said, a lot of work involved with it uh, compared to just sending the animals to an auction barn. But at the, with the auction barn, you're taking the risk, of course, of it being a good day or not a good day in terms of having numbers of buyers there to help you, um, to, uh, you know, to make, to bid on the animals and to, to uh, give you a good price for them. So all considerations, somebody has a question here. Oh, yep. Um, just a reminder to everybody, um, as you have questions, feel free to enter them into the chat box. Uh, we'll ask Wayne those questions. And also at the end, uh, we'll have more time for discussions as well. Yeah. So an important consideration on this, in all of this is turnover rate. How fast will I get my money back? How fast will I get a return on my investment? Um, because if you want to make money at this, you've got to turn the money over pretty quickly too to make it worth doing. So with sheep, goats, and pigs, from birth to market is six months or less. So you can buy, uh, you could buy sheep and goats, for example, in the fall and get them uh, bred, have uh, lambs born in the winter time, and sell them the following spring or summer. With broiler chicks. Uh, depending on the breed you buy, they're six to 15 weeks and off to market, depending on, depending again on which breed. Layer hens, um, if you buy chicks and develop them, they take five to six months to uh, uh, mature before they're ready to lay eggs. So uh, you're looking at 20 to 24 weeks of waiting for those eggs. Comparatively though, cattle, uh, if you want, you know, once calves have been born, which after is a long gestation period for the, waiting for the calves to be born and then to market in 14 to 18 months at a minimum or 26 to 28 months, depending on how long you want to feed them out. And if they're on being raised on pasture or being grain fed, so they can take a really long time to give you a return on the investment. There we go. So animal needs in general. Uh, what is it? What do you need to have in general to take care of animals to provide for their welfare? So they need good feed, which is used for growth, maintenance, and production, and of course, an ample supply of water. That is um, an essential nutrient. All the nutrients are important, but you've got to have water because it's used in all the whole pro every metabolic process in the body. So you've got to have a make sure they always have access to water. Uh, reasonable shelter during harsh times of the year. Uh, that varies from species to species. It's probably more critical for the young of most of the domesticated species. And this then becomes a, a business consideration as well, because you know if you have to invest in shelter right off the bat before you even get started, um, you know that can be a lot of money. And so then you're paying interest and trying to recoup all that. Uh, you get depreciation on it as well. So that's the tax break. But besides tax breaks, you need income. So the needs um, of the animals do vary according to species and the stage of development and the climate or the environment that they're in. So like, for example, in cold weather, they need more, more feed, more about 10% or more feed just to uh, have energy to stay warm. So the nutritional needs of animals, this is a consideration as well. So there's six basic nutrients, uh, carbohydrates and fats that provide energy for the body. 
Uh, protein builds muscle, minerals and vitamins, all needed for the metabolic processes, and water. Uh, these basic nutrients needs are usually met when they eat a balanced diet. And so, again, for the non-ruminants, you'll be buying uh, probably or preparing on farm balanced feed ration. And certainly with the, the ruminants, cattle, sheep, and goats, um, if you have them out on good forage and provide good forage through the winter time, plus salt and a good mineral that is designed for cattle, sheep, or goats, because they all have different mineral requirements, then they should do just fine with that. Uh, the ruminants are able to take forage and turn it into protein and energy for growth. So to, uh, just as a ballpark, animals typically need about two and a half to 3% of their body weight uh, for daily uh, amount of food consumed. And the needs do differ for each species as well as for individual breeds within species according to the season um, of the year, their age, their worker performance level, lactation, pregnancy, all of these are things that affect their nutritional needs. There's many times of the year uh, when the animals don't necessarily need a high level of uh, nutrient intake, that just a maintenance diet is good enough, but certainly during the periods of the latter part of gestation, and then lactation, uh, they need a much higher intake of uh, higher quality nutrients during that time. So the three main areas of nutritional needs are for growth, maintenance, and reproduction. And, and growth is the area where definitely animals use the most energy and protein. The young animals need more protein and energy for growth than the adults do. Uh, reproductive nutritional needs vary according to stage. So less at the beginning of gestation and more in the last trimester and during lactation. And maintenance typically needs less nutrition for bodily functions depending on stage, age, and the climate. Just for, you know, the maintenance aspect. That's really a, a, just a basic, basic diet at that point. Abundant water supply, of course, for um, all the stages, that can't be emphasized enough. And so if you're thinking about animals being out in a pasture setting, uh, they need to, they shouldn't have to walk too far to get to a water tank. Uh, if they do, then that becomes the, kind of complicated in a way, then they're being shortened, short uh, changed a little bit, if you will. Shelter, especially for the young, they need a draft free uh, and appropriate uh, environment for the species uh, by age. Uh, you know, all of the, the in particular, the, the early days of life for the young, for sheep, goats, pigs, uh, chickens in a Minnesota climate, they really need to be either in a shelter or, uh, you know, there is another option, uh, which I'll talk about in just a second. But uh, just as an example, hoops, for example, are not the best for young animals. They're too big, drafty, and cold. Um, and if you do have them out on pastures, and barns, they do need to be fenced to keep livestock in and maybe keep predators out. So Natural Resources Conservation Service has a fencing program. If you want to have pasture, they will help pay for much of it through EQIP, E-Q-I-P. Um, and you have to contact them. It takes some time to get that all set up, but they will. it's worth doing if you have uh, land that you want to fence around the perimeter, and every county has an NRCS office. Back to this idea of birthing, uh, birthing can take place out on pasture as well for sheep, goats, and cattle, and to some extent pigs. Um, 
and a lot of people have birthing take place out on the landscape in the late spring and early summer. Uh, there's a lady that I've worked with in the past who lives in Montana, and she has a couple hundred head of goats, and they do all of their kidding out on pasture in May and June. Um, she has a big barn for the uh, adults for the winter time, but it's not something in which they would uh, feel comfortable um, kidding. And plus, she is just comfortable with letting things take their course on the landscape, and she's done very well with it. So she paid for her farm uh, with goats, and uh, also by keeping her cost of uh, main operation down. So the same is true with sheep. You could have lambs out on the landscape uh, in May and June, or cattle. Here at the university, uh, there was an extension educator who just recently moved to Nebraska, but he had a herd of cattle down at Rosemount, and they um, calved on pasture in June and July. So it can be done and makes things so much simpler. Pigs can work okay out on a pasture setting, but you still need little buildings to uh, cover the pig pigs up once they've, if they don't go into it before they farrow, you'll want to move up a, a, the pigs into a little hut of some sort because they really struggle in, um, you know, in cold weather or if there's a heavy rain, that kind of thing, it can do little pigs in pretty quickly. So they are a little more fragile than the other, other species are out on the landscape, even in the spring and summer. So when you're thinking about animal welfare issues related to uh, livestock production, uh, there's a system called the Five Freedoms, and it was developed in Great Britain in the 1960s, and it was adopted by the veterinarians in, in Great Britain and eventually em embraced by the American Veterinary Society in this country as well. So the Five Freedoms are freedom from hunger and thirst, freedom, you know, having their food and water, as they needed, all animals deserve access to clean water and a well-balanced, nutritious diet. Freedom from discomfort, uh, so that means having shelter um, and being able to help them through hot or cold weather. Freedom from overcrowding, freedom from pain, injury, and disease, so they need good medical care. Freedom to express normal behavior. Uh, whatever that may be, but certainly exercise, moving about, freedom from fear and distress, uh, which can include love and understanding, but um, you may not love them or you may not understand them, but nonetheless, you should do the as much as possible to remove, to reduce fear and distress for the animals. Now, these, uh, these five freedoms are highly uh, controversial in some ways, and uh, you can talk and debate a lot about them, but these are just out there as, as a baseline from which people can work, and it gives you an idea of, well, just things to think about in the whole process of raising animals. But uh, certainly for me, at least, there are inherent contradictions in the five freedoms. So freedom versus safety. Uh, obviously, being out on the landscape in a field, there's issues with predators and weather. Um, freedom versus production efficiency, because out on, you know, um, for the non ruminants in particular, being out on the field uh, is very likely to reduce production efficiency. And yet, of course, animals may be theoretically happy out on the landscape or having great fun on all of that but it does reduce your overall profitability. So the freedom of uh, freedom versus economics. At the end of the end of the day, you want to make money doing this. And um, if you have, for example, tremendous bird loss because storms or predators, you're going to make less money. And so just uh, as an example of uh, what predation is like um, for the past, Oh, eight or 10 summers, we 
raised uh, broilers on the St. Paul campus in small portable huts that were moved on a daily basis. And because of the uneven ground, um, there would be times when a bird would escape and they would, the campus is uh, filled with hawks and they're by far and away the worst predator, but there's also coyotes, foxes and raccoons on campus and they all love chicken. So the hawks are relentless in terms of just uh, going after the huts continuously and they freak the birds out and then the birds because they're chickens and they're not thinking, they try to get out of the hut, uh, look for a place to go. And some of them will get out. If they would just stay inside, they would be fine, but they get out and then a hawk nails them. So that's kind of a classic uh, view of a bird that's been eaten by a hawk. They uh, open up the gut and eat the, they eat the breast meat and they open up the gut and take the intestines out and then they eat the organs because the organ meats are full of minerals and uh, they need that in their diet. So that's that's what they go after. And one day I was in the one of the huts and a hawk landed right beside me and he just looked in and he wasn't uh, worried about me at all. Uh, I found this one day um, and this just shows the cruelty of nature. It's not the romantic notion that people do have about it. Uh, this bird was still alive, even though part of its uh, breast meat was eaten off. So I had to euthanize it, of course. Uh, but that's just mo Mother Nature is uh, beautiful and cruel at the same time. Um, there are, you know, legal considerations as well in raising livestock. You need to make sure that your particular farm um, your or your land is zoned for livestock production. So uh, you can check with your, every county has a feedlot officer. You can check with them um, or the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Uh, but just to make sure that, you know, you're doing things right before you get started because you don't want to uh, get off on the wrong foot having invested a lot of money and then having to redo something. So, Minnesota Pollution Control measures manure production uh, by animal units. And so a dairy cow, a mature dairy cow is one and a half almost animal units. A cow calf pair is 1.2. That's a, a beef cow. Or a stock cow or a steer is one, one uh, animal unit. A horse is one animal unit, a heifer, seven tenths, and so on down the line. So you can see that the smaller creatures, like a pig, is uh, three tenths of one animal unit. So it would take three uh, big pigs, almost four big pigs, to equal a mature dairy cow. With sheep, it would take 14 sheep to equal a dairy cow in terms of manure production, a broiler, obviously, so on and so forth. But this is a, this can give you an idea of, because they will uh, let you know how many animal units, you know, your farm can um, support. And obviously you can have a lot of sheep or a lot of chickens on a small farm. So getting back to chickens, since um, we want, we're going to talk about chickens and sheep and goats and pigs all to some extent, but um, these are general introductions. And of course, uh, there's so much to learn about all of these. And even if you become an, a, you know really good at raising any of these, there will still be times when you'll have a new situation or... Um, something will happen that you can't deal with or you will lose animals. That does just happen on occasion. But in terms of the basic groups of chickens that exist, there's layers for egg production or the meat birds and what we call dual purpose, which is they do both provide both meat and eggs. They don't 
do either one. They don't provide, for example, as much meat as a meat bird or as many eggs as an egg bird, but they do both really well. And they're hardy animals usually and survive well on the landscape. And this often, the for example, the meat and egg, uh, the dual purpose bird, that's what people in the city will get. Uh, there's a breed called Buff Orpington, and that's very popular in Minnesota, in part because it's a big, thick bird and heavily feathered, and they can handle the Minnesota winters pretty well. Uh, then there's, of course, ornamental or exotic beauty uh, show birds, like the Polish bird, which has a big, uh, big tuft of hair on top of it, kind of like Albert Einstein, I guess, if you would. Uh, just wild wild hairdo on top and then the bantams which are a fourth to half the size of other birds um the breed dictates the egg collar and so leghorns typically have a white egg the heavy birds that are big birds like the or the uh, buff orpington they will have brown eggs um and then the oricanas or americanas as we call them up here Oricanas are from Chile originally. They provide the green Easter eggs that everybody liked to see. Uh, one thing about it, regardless of the color of the, um, of the shell, the egg nutrition is determined by the hen's diet, not the shell color. So just because you're buying brown eggs, it doesn't mean you're getting anything more nutritious than a white egg has. Unless there is things added to the diet which improve maybe its overall protein content or for example if flax is put into the diet of layer hens um, you could increase the omega-3 to the omega-6 ratio in the egg and that can be measured and and there are people who sell eggs that are uh, you know where the hens are fed flax and uh, they will put on their label the actual amount of omega-3 in the eggs and they have to have those regularly tested to show that they are at maintaining at that level. Now whether that's enough omega-3 in the eggs to make a difference in your overall health, who knows, but nonetheless it certainly is, does show you that the hen's diet uh, can affect egg quality. Uh, the brown egg layers, like the buff orpington and other birds, um, they were traditionally more practical on the landscape and still are for outdoor production, just simply because they're a hardy bird, heavily feathered, healthy and able to get around. They're meaty birds, if because eventually they'll end up in soup somewhere, easy to take care of. Um, but they did not work well once we started producing eggs on a mass scale. So that, you know, it's just amazing what our modern industry has been able to do in terms of providing everybody with cheap eggs up until recently with the um, avian influenza outbreak. But I visited a few years ago a uh, facility out by Wilmer where they were producing a million eggs a day. And just phenomenal to go through there. And there were actually very few workers. It was all um, robotic and uh, if not robotic, it was all with um, uh, conveyor belts going through the eggs, dropping onto conveyor belts and going through washing machines and eventually uh, getting packed. And there was a guy driving the end loader to, um, you know, put eggs in big boxes and put them out on the, uh, uh, to be picked up by trucks but it, it was uh, really amazing. But one of the main factors in choosing birds, uh, besides their high, product, high productivity, uh, the white birds, was the fact that their, their egg could be candled. And so a light is shined through it to look for any kind of defect inside the egg, the, say the potential a blood clot or the potential formation of a, a chicken. So that's hard to do with the brown eggs and consequently they lost favor and lost out, but they've come back a lot. People love to have the brown, the brown birds around with brown eggs and um, 
they just do well, especially in a more extensive system. There's trade-offs with all of the breeds. So regarding meat breeds, this is the Cornish cross. It's the standard of the industry. There's no bird that grows faster or more efficient than it does. It's just incredible how it will grow from birth to ready for market in six to six weeks to eight weeks at the most. Uh, but that's also an issue. They can have heart problems and leg problems uh, just because they grow so fast. Another problem with them, so this they are, uh, as I mentioned, the backbone of the broiler industry. We produce, um, oh, it's right at nine billion broilers a year in this country, which is phenomenal to think about. Nine billion. Um, one issue with the Cornish cross, they were developed to be fast growing and to have a big breast on them because the breast is lean meat. And at the time, this whole process of developing the bird was happening. People were concerned about eating meat and heart disease. And so um, they kept making the breast ever and ever leaner. And now it has turned into a problem within the industry. They discuss this openly. Uh, that as much as 10% of the breast meat sold over the counter has a condition called woody breast, which means it is so tough and dry that it is essentially inedible, tough to chew. And if you've ever come across a breast like that, which it seems to me like most breast meat is, um, that's woody breast. And that's a product of modern, uh, modern production. So alternatives to the uh, Cornish cross are red broilers or re uh, red rangers, they're called, and they're similar to the freedom rangers. These birds grow slower, 10 to 12 weeks um, to reach a four and a half pound carcass. That's if they're kept in buildings and moved on a regular basis. They are not as big breasted, but they do have legs that uh, have a lot of dark meat on them and they're really good eating, I think. And they're fun to grow. They're much more active and fun to watch, but they do take time. So this is um, me on the St. Paul campus with one of our huts. We have 10 of these and we would raise 300 at a time, two batches in the summertime, uh, 600 birds more or less. And we sold them to restaurants around the neighborhood. Um, and this in this batch, we happen to have Cornish cross, but we did switch over time and we raised a lot more of the uh, the Freedom Rangers. This is an example of a guy up by Renshaw, Minnesota. He uh, has uh, two units like this that are portable, but he has to move them with a tractor. And uh, he'll move them every two or three days. Each one of these huts are big enough that they could hold a couple hundred birds. And so it works for him because he's raising a lot of birds for sale. Um, and you can see that these are almost ready for market. But this is something you could consider as well for your landscape is to build, if you didn't want to make small huts, you could have a couple of big huts like this and then raise a lot of chickens in it. Um, all creatures have a thermal neutral zone. Uh, and that is the range of environmental temperatures where they can be just comfortable, just like us. Uh, and chickens are the same. They, they like it between 60 and 75, and I think we do too. Uh, but when you get over 75 for birds and us, it starts heating up and we begin to feel a little bit uncomfortable. So we're looking for ways to cool off. Uh, likewise, when it gets below 60, I'm looking for more food to eat, and so do chickens. Um, they need, when it gets down you know, into the 30s and et cetera, they need 10% more feed just to stay warm because they're, the process of digestion creates heat in their body. So chickens uh, eat various amounts depending on their age and their environmental conditions and feed. So meat birds need a 20 to 22% crude protein starter and an 18% crude finisher, crude protein finisher. And they'll go to, from hatch to market in six to 14 weeks, depending on the breed. 
egg layers need 18 to 20 percent group protein as chicks and then there's a period where they've kind of grown but they're still not mature so they need a, a slightly lower protein content 14 to 16 percent and then um when they're gearing up and ready to lay eggs 16 to 18 percent protein crude protein in the diet for laying eggs um if you let the chickens out to forage, that's fine, but you must provide a balanced uh, formulated feed for them. Free range chickens cannot meet their nutrient requirements by foraging, only foraging. They will die or won't produce any meat or eggs at all. Um, I had a young couple who wanted to uh, do a practice run of raising broilers on the landscape and just letting them roam out in the field and let them eat insects and seeds and whatever else they might find. Um, I told them that simply would not work. The animals would not survive. And they finally fed them a minimum amount of a balanced feed ration and finally came time to process the birds. And when they did, they found the birds had no meat on them at all. And so they were planning to sell them to people, but realized they couldn't sell birds with no meat. So they had had them in the freezer. They had the soup birds for the winter. Um, they've got to have a balanced feed ration. That's just all there is to it. So pigs, um, consumer, why pigs? Uh, well, pigs can be great fun. And I grew up, we raised a lot of pigs. My dad was considered a good hog man in the neighborhood. And uh, he just, he knew what he was doing. And uh, it was important to him to raise good pigs. Um, so there's more and more demand for quality pork. And when I say quality pork, I mean something besides the other white meat. For me, the... Um, one of the most successful marketing campaigns in history has ruined modern pork production. And they did that, again, it was the same kind of thing where back in the 60s, people were associating heart disease with meat consumption, especially fatty meat. And that's um, much less so a uh, consideration today, but it was certainly was back then. So in a way to counteract that, the pork industry pushed towards ever leaner and leaner pork um, and calling it the other white meat. So hugely successful, but the kind of pork that you buy in the grocery store does not represent what pork can and should be, in my opinion. Um, pork should be deep red and marbled with uh, fat and really good eating. I have bought meat from a uh, pork from a farmer out in Western Minnesota for the last, oh, 20 some years. And I've only bought pork in the grocery store two or three times. And every time I did, I was disappointed. So for me, there really is a difference. And I think you can find, you would find that to be the same as well by buying meat from somebody local who's producing it on a farm using alternative breeds. Oh, so hi, these are, Wayne. Yes. Oh. Sorry, a uh, quick question with that. Yes, I, I have noticed that uh, when I go to the county fairs and the state fairs, uh, the, the hogs that they have at the fairs, they look so different from the hogs, you know, that I remember growing up. Um, is it mostly about which breed of hog you raise or is it the, the rations or is it a combination of both to be able to get that higher fat content because you're spot on there's a huge difference with flavor and everything yeah um it, it is largely breeds the breeds have been developed over time to be ever leaner and leaner and there is one breed in particular um that's used in modern confinement facilities and that's and in this country we raise um 100 million pigs a year and so um, that's PIC genetics, and it's super lean. It was developed specifically to cater to this market of the other white meat. But there are other breeds out there, and 
Um, this list I took from Oklahoma State. They have a great web page, as good or better than anybody else, on on all the different breeds of swine. And these are ones that were traditionally used. Well, some of them were used in the past, uh, like Duroc, Chester White, and Berkshire, and Gloucester, Old Spot. Uh, they were common on the farms back before we became concerned about producing the other white meat. These breeds tend to carry more fat. And the red wattle is one that's um, not, was never mainstream, but it's really good eating as well. It's a, it's a pig that will produce a fair amount of fat on the meat. And you uh, quite honestly need the fat to give the meat flavor. But you don't, you know, you don't have to eat all of the fat. You can cut it off, and still get the meat. But that extra fat does provide juiciness and flavor. So these are just uh, some of the breeds out there that people are using, especially Berkshire. Um, Chester White is known. It's an older breed that is known for its mothering ability. So people will buy Duroc. Uh, or Berkshire boars and cross them with Chester White to get prolificacy, but also at the same time to get, um, you know, pigs that have better meat quality. Or they'll take a Gloucester old spot boar and cross it with a Chester White female and, um, and get, you know, really good meat that way. Yeah, it's, it does make a difference. Um, I got served pork in a restaurant in, uh, I ordered pork in a restaurant in uh, Pennsylvania once and I couldn't eat it. <laughs> it was very obviously modern genetics, which doesn't cut it for me. So if you have, uh, if you want to feed pigs and, and uh, you can, you know, pigs can be weaned at three to six weeks of age, although, um, Really, the longer you wait, the better. So I would say six to eight weeks. And if you uh, want to buy feeder pigs, I would certainly buy pigs that were at least eight weeks old and start pigs on a creep feed. It's called 26% uh, crude protein prior to weaning and then uh, continue with that. So as the pigs get bigger, you can see over here on the, on the part below that as in each stage of growth and development, the protein requirements uh, decline. And uh, when they get big, they start to eat a lot of food, four to six pounds of feed per day. And then pigs go to market, at, you know, at whatever size you want them to, but typically these days, 250 to 300 pounds is common to, to market a pig. And um, I know people who are doing direct marketing and they will sell halves or holes of pigs and uh, get them processed custom, meaning not inspected, but uh, nonetheless, um, the person will just buy the pig outright and they'll, the person, the farmer will deliver the pig to the processor and they'll either get a half or a whole pig cut up for them. And it can work out really well. Um, sheep. Uh, sheep fit really well on a small farm and I'm partial to sheep as well. I like pigs, pigs, poultry, and sheep are my favorite. Um, and it's hard to say probably sheep are my favorite overall. We had a flock when I was a kid and it was great fun to raise sheep. Uh, um, and during the lambing season, it was just a lot of fun to be out there taking care of them. Uh, they're relatively easy to handle on a small farm and easy for kids to handle. So they can become a 4-H project. Um, they're great in a uh, pasture setting. Um, good income for the farm as well. And can be, uh, you know, an animal that you can sell through direct marketing. And that's something that the whole family can learn about, uh, get involved in, is that whole process of direct marketing. Um, we, when I was a kid, we raised sheep. Um, but we never ate the meat because we regular had a regular diet of poultry and pork and beef 
there was kind of a rotation of poultry, pork, beef, poultry, pork, beef. And one year, we actually uh, processed a lamb, and it was a completely new flavor to us. We did not like it, and we fed it all to the dogs. But since that time, I've become quite a fan for um, lamb meat. And uh, it's it just, you know, lamb kebabs on the grill, that's pretty hard to beat. Or one thing that uh, can be done, too, is taking a ground up lamb um, and mixing it with beef to make lamb burgers. But it's really a great combo and goes down quite easily. Uh, this slide is old, but none, it's, uh, if anything, at this point, these numbers have declined because in Minnesota and nationwide, our overall sheep inventory continues to go down, even in spite of tremendous demand and incredible profit in the last three years of raising, raising sheep. So you can see that farms with inventory of one to 24, uh, one to 24 lambs or sheep, overwhelmingly, that's uh, the majority of farms in Minnesota. There's 1,900, 1900 farms that have sheep at this time in 2012. Um, and 1,100 had one to 24 lambs or sheep on the farm. Then you had a group of about 600 farms that had up to 99 animals. And you can see that it's declining as the numbers get bigger. And so that at a certain point, only um, two people had a thousand ewes, and those are quite the operation. Uh, but you can see that it's uh, overwhelmingly, people have a hundred ewes or less in Minnesota. So they really do fit well on a small farm. Uh, they we've been around uh, sh raising sheep forever. They were domesticated over 10,000 years ago. Um, dogs probably were first, most likely, or and then sheep and goats or cats, who knows. Uh, they have an instinct to flock, to stay together as a group and they're ruminants so they can turn forage into digestible protein. They can live a long time, but their productive years are only about uh, three to six years. Uh, goats tend to walk. Uh, so some of the difference between sheep and goats, goats walk with the tail straight out or uh, up or out, whereas sheep, their tail is longer and it hangs down. Most sheep have wool, although there are uh, a lot of breeds of hair sheep. Uh, originally uh, in the tropical regions of the world, but now we have people raising hair sheep uh, in Minnesota and in upper, the upper Midwest. They're quite common now here. But most sheep have wool and most goats have hair. Goats are browsers, meaning they, they're like deer. They like to eat brushy plants. They will eat grass too, but they prefer um, brushy plants, whereas sheep are grazers. And sheep flock, they stay together. Goats are independent and curious. They are truly curious. And um, you have to have good fencing for goats. People say that uh, the joke is that if you um, if water can flow through it, then goats can get through it. So that's just how feisty <laughs> goats can be. Most uh, sheep don't have horns. They're polled naturally, uh, while most Many, if not most goats, do have horns. Uh, let's see. Yeah, there we go. So Hampshire is a popular breed in Minnesota. One of the largest breeds out there, largest stature. It's a British breed. Good milking ewes. Sometimes have lambing difficulty. Um, I would say sometimes, but not always, certainly. And on campus, uh, the sheep, the small ruminant specialist on campus, has a flock of 30 to 40 uh, purebred Hampshires. And um, they've been doing really well. They have more than a 200% lambing average. So they've had to help some of them, but they're also getting a lot of lambs. So they have a lightweight fleece, medium wool. 
Auden is a new, relatively new breed developed in the 1970s um, and it's popular across the country, uh, both in terms of breeds that are registered, so purebred, but it also just um, herds that are not purebred as well. Uh, it is a hair sheep or a hair sheep lineage, a natural, it has a natural resistance to internal parasites better than other breeds, not completely naturally resistant, but certainly better than other breeds. Um, easy to handle, they're low maintenance, they, they sound ideal and in many ways they are. Um, use lamb easily and are great mothers and the, lean, the carcasses are lean and meaty. And that's kind of what you want in sheep production because quite honestly, people don't like the flavor of the fat. It's one of the areas where uh, the fat, you know, like beef fat or uh, pork fat is has a good flavor to it. People don't like the lamb fat. Uh, Polypay was developed out in uh, Idaho and they can lamb twice a year. And uh, high quality carcasses, and they're a mixture of these breeds, uh, the Rambouillet, the Targi, Dorset, and Finn sheep, and they have a medium to fine fleece. Suffolk is a common breed in the U.S. They're big, rangy animals, black-faced, that's used for good milkers, and they produce rapidly growing lambs with a lot of meat, and it's a, a lean meat, known for fast growth rate, um, black face, ears and legs, and they are shown commonly uh, for 4-H. They're just, uh... so there they are. So in the upper left is a Hampshire, and down below is a Katahdin. Uh, yes, the uh, the sheep with the tail is a Katahdin. The Polypay in the upper right, and then the Suffolk in the lower right. But these are popular in Minnesota and around the country. But there are so many breeds that uh, you know you can um, choose from. It's really a matter of what you want to pursue, and so that's where you you know begin doing your own research, and then you try things and move towards uh, whatever goal it is you have with them. So keys to profitability, uh, which is an important aspect of managing livestock on the farm. Uh, you got to manage the feed cost for your ewe flock. You make sure the ewe gets the right level of nutrition at the right time. You don't want to shortchange the ewe, but you don't want to overfeed her as well. And in fact, if you do overfeed her at the wrong time, that can have a negative impact on reproduction. So you want to manage the feed intake uh, right up to lactation time um, or, well, you want to manage it right up to the, uh, and gradually increase it in the last third of gestation and then increase it again during um, lactation so that she can milk properly and feed the lambs. Your goal for lamb production should be 150 to 200% lambs per ewe. So one and a half to two lambs per ewe. So you ideally you're getting a lamb that will pay for the cost of the ewe and then the other lamb will be your um, your profit. So on the St. Paul campus with the Hampshire, they're getting over 200% lambing. It's quite phenomenal. Orphan lambs, um, quite honestly, can be ex an expense that if you use um, milk replacer, it may not be worth it because milk replacer is so expensive that you would lose money feeding them. But if you can get goat milk, or whole cow milk, um, that can work. Uh, cow milk is not ideal because it doesn't have as much fat as goat milk or sheep milk, but it would work if you can't get the others. Hmm. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, bottle lambs are not often profitable just because milk replacer is so expensive. So you want to avoid using milk replacer if you can. Hmm. Interesting. Oh, hey, Wayne. Oh, oh yeah, we, we got a couple questions in. Um, okay. uh, first one is, are sheep more susceptible to parasites and sickness than goats? Uh, no, both are susceptible. Um, 
some are more susceptible than others. And within breeds, within a flock that you may have, some within that flock may be more susceptible than the rest of them. So uh, when it comes to managing parasites, loads, you certainly can use uh, treatments. And I've got a, a page, or um, I have a list of resources at the very end of this, and it will have a page where it will tell you uh, how to go about worming your lambs, your sheep and goats effectively. But ultimately, what you'll have to do too is just monitor because there are animals that just carry a heavy load and it affects their overall well-being and you just get rid of them. Whereas there are other animals that can carry something of a load and it doesn't seem to affect their productivity at all. But that's true in both sheep and goats. Interesting, interesting, thank you. Um, and then the, the second question, are there sheep that are raised specifically for wool versus meat um, or can they be a dual purpose? Um, they tend to be in this country dual purpose simply because for the most part, wool has little or no value. It's actually an expense to get rid of it. And so that's the, the beauty of having hair sheep um, is that they will, um, you know, the hair sheep don't have wool or if there's a cross between hair sheep and wool sheep, um, like uh, the Katahdin, they will shed their hair. They will have wool, but they shed it in the springtime. So you don't have to hire somebody to come shear. The wool that is typically valuable is Merino. So that is a breed that has a very, very fine quality wool. And if you buy, if you go to, oh, like a rec um, outdoor recreational store, like REI, they'll be selling merino underwear, long underwear, merino socks, uh, gloves lined with merino wool, that kind of thing. But merino is a brand of wool that's really been popularized, but in part because it's very comfortable to wear. They're very expensive too. But the other breeds tend to be, um, well, we have wool, we gotta get rid of it. So we have to shear them and uh, deal with it. And that's just kind of a loss that you have to deal with because wool in this country has very little value. That's, you know, some effort is made to change that, but over time people still don't wear a lot of wool clothing like they used to. It used to be everybody wore wool and um, and it was high quality, et cetera, but that, those days are gone. People like to throw stuff in the dryer and pull it out and put it on and have it be wrinkle-free. Is there another question? Oh, that's the end of them for right now. But that that is very interesting to to hear that. Um, just the the decrease in, uh, yeah, uh, marketing for for wool and knowing that that's a uh, an added expense just for for maintenance. So that was a great question and a great answer. Thank you. Okay, so we've covered this. Uh, you want to keep your death loss low, of course. 10% or less, ideally less than 5%. Uh, your U costs you the same whether she has twins or a single. So you want her to have twins if possible and keep them both alive. Um, and this is something that all of us hate, but of course you got to do it. And that is you got to use production records. You've got to write it down because you can't remember everything. And so at the end of the lambing season, when you're weaning sheep, Weaning the lambs off, the skinny you that weaned three lambs is actually the one you want to keep. The big fat you that raised a single uh, is, you know, should probably go to market. But she looks good at the end of the season. So it's only through through records that you can really deal with that. And and uh, I think it's just getting used to writing it down or, you know, having a, a program that you can access 
on the computer or your cell phone and just add information to it right when you're in the barn, just to make sure it's in there. And your ram is uh, the most important sheep on the farm. Pick a good one that has a, a history, family history to him. Um, spend money on him and take care of him because he's 50% of your lamb crop. So always keep that in mind. Uh, so for the breeding season in sheep, um, typically breed, uh, most breeds are seasonal breeders, meaning that um, they tend to breed in the fall as the days get shorter. That stimulates estrus. Uh, so they need extra feed during uh, late gestation and lactation, as I mentioned before, but also there is this idea of flushing the animals a couple of weeks before they uh, begin the breeding season. So if you've had them on a minimal diet during the summer out on forage with minerals, you feed them some grain to uh, a pound of two of grain uh, per day for two to three weeks prior to breeding and up to four weeks after breeding. And this will help to improve your lambing or kidding rate by 10 to 20%. You'll get more twins. So the whole idea of flushing, having them come in decent, but not, you know, looking maybe even a little thin, and then beginning this process of feeding them grain for a couple of weeks, and then continuing that through breeding. The two pounds, well, uh, um, high protein hay or a pound of grain a day, one to two pounds, depending on their size. You don't want ewes to be fleshy or fat, and the same with does, because that actually will decrease their reproductivity. They need two to four percent of their body weight each day um, in dry matter. And they'll drink about a gallon, gallon of water a day on average. They need salt, vitamin, mineral mix. Um, Nine to 14 percent protein in their diet. And that can be provided mainly by a good quality pasture or hay. Uh, regarding parasites, all sheep have some internal parasites. So do goats. Um, some can tolerate it better than others. So the big thing is to manage your parasite load on the farm by uh, pasture rotation, taking uh, moving animals through the pasture uh, rapidly so that they don't graze too close because the worm eggs typically are an inch or two up on the grass leaf, on the grass stem. So you don't want them to eat really short. You wanna keep moving the animals through the pasture before they graze it down completely. You can also, as I mentioned earlier, you can select a sheep with a higher tolerance for worms and they actually will do quite, quite well. But you also can develop a um, a program where you're giving wormer, but you have to be careful about uh, developing uh, tolerance, in, you know, for the uh, the parasites to develop resistance, because that does happen. That's already happened over time, and a lot of the wormers don't work very well anymore. Um, just uh, in just in general, feed livestock in a bunk not on the ground, make sure they have adequate space, provide hay in the feeder or the rack. And for his feeders, uh, like a self feeder for ground feed, check your feeder regularly to make sure that it's adjusted so that pigs or poultry can uh, get the feed out of it. Uh, regarding direct marketing, here is some uh, websites on how to get started with it. Minnesota Grown Directory is a place where you could advertise um, if you're going to sell retail, you've got to have meat processed and inspected. So you need to talk to Minnesota Dairy, uh, Dairy and Food Inspections. And then there are different places where you can um, maybe get started, like going to the farmer's market or reading information on, on the MISA website, which is the Minnesota Institute for Sustainable Agriculture. And of course, develop your own farm website. Um, show people what you're doing and why you have a great product. Let your neighbors know that you're marketing meat. 
uh, etc. I see that. I think we have some more. Do we have more uh, questions? Yes. Yep. Um, we've got one uh, with their tentative business model is to direct market about 150 goats or sheep annually is the is the goal. And is it unreasonable to think um, that we'll be able to find a custom capable processor of meeting that volume? Um, well, so the processing has become a bigger issue over time as more and more people have gotten into direct marketing. And um, so it can be potentially an issue. You may end up having drive to drive a long distance in order to find a, a processor who will do your animals for you on a regular basis. A hundred to 150 animals is not a lot. And if you're bringing in a handful every week or so, um, they can handle that, that provided that they can take on more customers, that would be the case. And so I would, if I were you, I would contact, um, I would start looking, even before you start with this, I would start looking around for processors who can do the work for you. And um, if you're wanting them custom, of course, that means that they are not inspected. That plant is inspected several times a year by the uh, by dairy and food inspections. But on the day of processing, they don't have an inspector there to look at the carcasses. Whereas an inspected plant, all the carcasses that go through it are inspected by a USDA or a Minnesota inspector. And those carcasses can go retail. They can be sold to restaurants or grocery stores. When you sell it custom, you essentially make an agreement with the person to buy that animal. You deliver it to the processor and they negotiate with the processor for what they want done. So, but, but I tell you, it is, it has become an issue and it's even become an issue uh, regardless of species to find a processor. So one thing you don't want to do is have animals ready for processing and not have somebody who can do it. So start early and look, look for somebody who can do it just to make sure you can get it done. I, but I know that people routinely, especially as you get further out West and up North, people will haul animals an hour to an hour and a half in each direction to get them processed. So that means dropping them off, getting them processed. They've got to go back then and pick up if it's, um, you know, something that they're going to deliver. If, if it's inspected, they'll go back and pick it up and uh, then deliver it to their grocery stores and restaurants that are using it. But yeah, that's, that's a major expense and investment of time. Absolutely. I, I know the, I get to, uh, I buy a, a whole hog and a whole steer. And yeah, with the, with the pandemic that came through, it really changed processing times. And yeah, had a lot of farmers um, in predicaments with where to bring their, their livestock. And I know that they're really pushing uh, for more, more people to be educated and to start up their own processing facilities. So if people are interested, um, I'm not sure if there are still grants available for that, um, but they are they're really trying to to push that. And it sounds like uh, Miranda mentioned that the Clean Chicken Company is opening a goat and sheep processing plant in Wilmer, hopefully open in August. So that would yeah. be a nice addition. They've been working on that for a while. And um, so... Clean Chickens actually is a company that he has a couple of different semis and they do, um, they have a portable processing. So they go to a location and they will process birds on your farm or they'll set up somewhere where they can process birds for a variety of farms. But now they've also gotten into this idea of developing a processing plant uh, for sheep and goats. Um, and I hope it can work. My concern is that 
even in Minnesota and Wisconsin, we don't really have enough goats to uh, keep them going on a regular supply. So well, I hope it goes well for them. Um, and that would be one to contact, but Wilmer, depending on your location, location, Wilmer may be a long ways away. And they'll be ready in maybe in August. Hope so. So oh, resources, sorry. go ahead. Oh, sorry, what, one more question just quick came in. Um, they are wondering if you're available to answer more questions via phone or email after the meeting. To the meeting, yeah, by email. My email is uh, on this um, PowerPoint, and I'll make a PDF of it and send it to you, and you can send it to everybody who uh, who joined. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Wayne. Yeah. So yeah, but I'd be glad to answer uh, questions. My, uh, I'll show it when we get all the way through the slides. Show my email. But sure, glad to talk. So uh, I have a list of resources here. Part of this is a partial list, but different places, really good websites on sheep and goats. Uh, ironically, Maryland, which doesn't necessarily have a lot of sheep and goat production, but they have an extension specialist there who put together a great, great web page, Maryland Sheep and Goat. Cornell has it as well, the American Sheep Industry. Um, I like this one a lot, the Lamb Resource Center. They have uh, fact sheets on all aspects of production and marketing. So there's just a ton of information on that website. Then of course, there are books you can buy like Stories Guide to Raising Sheep. Um, and then we have listservs at the U and I don't know how active they are at this point because I don't manage them anymore. So, uh, but there's a sheep and poultry and meat goat and the swine listserv and you can find those at the MISA website, the Minnesota Institute for Sustainable Agriculture. ATRA is an organization that also has publications on sheep and goats. Um, so the American, one that I wanna point out here on worm control, this work at wormx.info, the American Consortium for Small Ruminant Parasite Control. This will tell you how to try to manage your sheep and goat worm load. And it can help, but again, what you have to do is really watch for animals that appear to be getting run down. And if it's because of a worm load, then just you have to get rid of them and gradually create a flock that is as resistant as you can get. So, Last but not least, goats. Why, uh, why goats? Um, they actually are a fun animal to have around, but they can be kind of overwhelming too because they're so noisy and active and curious. But they really do like to be around people. And uh, whereas sheep are kind of um, in their own world, <laughs> so they don't, they don't interact as much, but um, compared to goats, so people have great fun with them and they're great for each project for the kids. As browsers, they will do brush clearing for you. They can kill brush over time. So like buckthorn or other uh, brush that's a uh, weedy uh, pest problem, they can help get rid of it. And then the market is hot for goats and um, to both demand from goat meat and sheep and lamb meat have just um, increased incredibly in the last three to five years. And the prices that you can get at the farm gate are phenomenal. And that's almost um, exclusively because of the new immigrant community. The, so, uh, the Africans and Latinos eat a lot of lamb and goat. They eat other things as well, other meats, but they do like lamb and goat, whereas most mainstream Euro-Americans eat very little lamb. Um, that's just the way it's been for a long time and that hasn't changed. All the, all the increase in demand is coming from the new immigrants. The Somalis in particular prefer goat meat. And um, yeah, and it's part of their regular diet to eat a lot of it. 
So that's one reason why the prices have been so good at some of the sale barns. Uh, like sheep, we've raised goats forever. Today, there are some 200 different breeds of goats. So they produce products including milk, meat, and uh, fiber, such as mohair and cashmere. Um, this is old information um, as well, like my last slide, but also, uh, if anything, it, numbers have continued to go down. And I don't know why. Even in spite of the profitability of sheep and goats, they both continue to decline in Minnesota and across the country. And so a lot of the meat for sheep and goats is coming in from Australia and New Zealand. Um, and that's too bad because we should be able to produce it right here and take advantage of these tremendous prices. But you can see there's not a lot of, uh, not a lot of uh, goats raised in, in Minnesota. But in terms of meat goats, there's the Spanish goat, which came to us via Mexico. And actually it was one of those breeds, uh, kind of like cattle that was turned loose um, by the Spanish and then, or got loose and then um, became its own breed. And they are hardy and able to deal with uh, adverse conditions. Uh, I think they do have some resistance to uh, worms. Um, maybe a little bit more than others. So they can be a good breed to cross with others. So the South African boar goat is the one that is really uh, a true meat goat. I mean, they look, they look like um, Arnold Schwarzenegger of goats, big muscular bred over time to have a heavy high quality carcass. They're really um, big meaty animals. They also, can be a little um, difficult to raise just simply because of, uh, uh, I guess, I don't, um, I guess what I would say is they can suffer from disease a little bit easier maybe than other breeds. Um, so it's better like any of these to cross them in order to uh, get hybrid vigor. Kiko is another one, uh, New Zealand, uh, Feral goat stock, uh, a hardy large framed animal. So Kiko could be crossed with others. Uh, myotonic breed, which is uh, interesting because of uh, if you startle them, they just immediately are paralyzed temporarily and they fall over. They can't move. And I don't know why that is um remained in them, why it is popular, but it does, if you cross them with a the boar goat, the fainting gene doesn't cross over, so it's lost. So, um, but they can be crossed with a variety of breeds as well. But one that's also out of South Africa, the boar goat is out of South Africa, and the savanna goat looks very similar to uh, um, a boar goat, but it's a different breed and it's a hardy animal, large framed, extremely well muscled like, like a boar goat, uh, but very adaptable and successful in extensive grazing systems um, or in intensive pasture systems as well. So uh, a lot of people are recommending the savanna over the boar goat, um, you know, and then of course, if you want to uh, cross it with something else to get hybrid vigor. It is not a seasonal breeder. So that means it can breed at any time of the year. And so you can manage that breeding season to uh, match you know, what you would like, uh, say if you wanted a lamb or kid on pasture so that there's a time when there's an adequate supply of uh, good cheap feed to feed the ewe, the, the goat, so that she can nurse the land, the kid. Very fertile and prolific. And that's a nice feature as well, a high twinning rate. So the savanna is not to be underestimated and they are becoming more popular in this country. These are all the dairy breeds and I'm not gonna go into them because um, just simply my own bias. I'm not very excited about uh, 
dairy animals. Um, I think it's, you know, unless you have a, uh, it's like a specialty market for cheese production or something like that. It's really hard to have your own small dairy and make it profitable. If you do have sufficient uh, flock of um, dairy animals to have milk to sell, then it's going to be sold most likely to uh, processing plants in Wisconsin. So you have the shipping and they pay what they want. And they are also getting uh, milk. Now, uh, Wisconsin is the largest, it has the largest number of dairy goats in the nation. It used to be California, but Wisconsin has, as they've gotten out of dairy cows, they're into uh, dairy goats. And so there are big dairy, goat dairy operations in Wisconsin. One has um, 6,000 goats and another has, a couple of others have 3,000 goats. They have over 40,000 dairy goats in uh, in Wisconsin. So you're competing with that, that those kind of people that can serve a market. And um, I just, I just would not recommend the investment of uh, all the infrastructure needed to support a um, herd of dairy goats. Certainly, if you are all passionate to do so, I say, then go right ahead. And best wishes to you for that. But um, on the other hand, I could see having a couple of dairy goats around who were milking during the lambing season so that you could um, feed uh, dairy goat milk to any orphans that came along. And if you didn't have uh, any orphans, you could use the milk for something else as well. So as ruminants, they're uh, uh, goats ruminants, just like cows and sheep. So they convert roughage into energy and protein. Um, they are browsers. They prefer brush. They'll consume three to five percent of their body weight in dry matter daily. Um, some meat goat marketing myths, like I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, people who want um, meat, it's the new immigrant community. And um, there was a guy named Holcomb who said in 1994 that worldwide goat meat production is higher than meat production from cattle or hogs. And that was picked up by ATRA and others organizations and that has gone around the world. And it's not even close to being true. Um, other sources will say goat meat is the most widely eaten meat in the world. Well, first of all, what does widely eaten mean? Uh, if you kind of pin people down about it, they'll say, well, it's accepted in all communities, whereas pork is not, for example. Um, and then you'll even have 63% of all red meat eaten is goat meat. Or I've even seen 63% of all meat eaten is goat meat, not even close. Um, the Food and Agriculture Organization um, of the United Nations tracks a tonnage of meat produced around the world. And so in 2014, this, by the way, of course, needs to be updated because this has even changed. But in 2014, overwhelmingly, um, people ate pork, 115 million tons, poultry meat, 108 million tons, uh, beef, 68 million tons, and sheep and goats together, 14 million tons, of which only 4 million tons was um, goat meat. And that is, uh, you know, this is meat that, that's sold on international exchange, so it's well tracked. We know that these, this data is accurate. Um, by now, actually, poultry now is the number one consumed meat. Pea, pork is still second, and then beef. Um, worldwide, more goat milk is consumed than cow milk. Um, that was recently in the Washington Post. Not true. Cattle produce 83% of the uh, milk production in the world, followed by buffaloes, and then goats at 2% and sheep at 1%. 
So don't believe everything you see in the <laughs> in the news out there, especially when it comes to marketing. It's exclusively consumed by the new immigrant communities. I've already kind of covered that. So uh, if you want to sell sheep and goats, the Zimbrota Live Livestock Auction is a good place. There are also a couple of other good um, auction barns in Minnesota. One is at Pipestone and the other at Jackson. Pipestone and Jackson and Zimbrota are the three places where buyers come from Chicago and Kansas City. And they're shipping to uh, Pennsylvania and the East Coast. And that's where prices are determined for what they'll pay at your, um, you know, at the livestock auctions. So you wanna go where there is demand for your animals because if you take them to any old sale barn and there's no buyers there, you're going to give away your sheep and goats. And there's no reason to do that. It's worth it to haul them a little extra further and get a, be pretty assured of getting a good price. So you can uh, look online at Zambroda or at Pipestone and check their um, weekly market reports and they'll show you exactly how well they've done with sheep and goats. You may have people who wanna come out to the farm and buy sheep and goats there, which they can do, but it is technically illegal for you to let them slaughter on the farm. You're then becoming a, uh, whether you realize it or not, you're becoming a processor and you're not licensed to be a processor. So there's also the liability issue. What if they got hurt while they're on your farm? So don't let them do that. Let them buy the animal and take it away to wherever they want to slaughter. Um, one final area that we want to cover is biosecurity. Um, and this is a way of protecting your farm and your animals to prevent or reduce disease introduction from people, animals, equipment, and vehicles. And this is really important. And just for example, right now with avian influenza still around, um, you know, if you are thinking of raising poultry, you want to do Think about how can you protect those birds as best as possible from um, bringing avian influenza onto the farm. So components of a biosecurity plan are these different areas, isolation of visitor policy, cleaning and disinfection, um, you know, not hauling disease home and not borrowing disease from neighbors and controlling wildlife pests and other uh, birds and other pests. So for isolation on new or returning animals uh, from your farm, you want to house them separately for at least 30 days and ideally 200 yards from other animals, but that may or may not be possible. But at the very least, if you can house them in an area separately for 30 days, just to see how they're doing, make sure they're okay before you mix them with your other animals. And you work with the isolated animals last. You start with the young animals first and go through your uh, standard animal, um, animals that you already had, and then to finish up by visiting and taking care of the new animals. And ideally, wear separate clothing or at least change your footwear before you go take care of the isolated animals. Uh, use a separate by age, of course and then um, use a sick pen if necessary to isolate sick animals. Only allow people to take care of your birds or animals uh, to come into contact with them. Otherwise, nobody else should necessarily be around your livestock. Um, if you have visitors for the birds or for other animals, um, you know, don't let them enter the bird area or have access to the birds. Um, you want to keep people away. If they have birds of their own, they should stay for um, stay away from their your farm for 24 to 72 hours. Uh, well, they should stay away from their own birds, and that's not likely. So, uh, you know, 24 to 72 hours prior to visiting your farm would be ideal, but that's not going to happen. So that's the consideration you have to take. Uh, 
So for cleaning and disinfection, of course, you want to prevent germs from spreading by cleaning shoes. So you want to have a foot bath at the entrance of buildings and uh, a, at the very least, a spray bottle with disinfectant. You also want to clean in the water, uh, clean your water and feeder troughs regularly. Regarding the foot bath, if there is solid material, you want to have a brush there because if there's solid material on the bottom of your shoe, even if you've dipped the shoe in there, it's still not clean. So you want to use a brush to get the stuff off and then dip it again to make sure you've tried to kill any uh, germs that may be on your shoes. Um, ideally, use the designated vehicle to leave farm or home, especially if you're going to a farm store and then clean the vehicle before returning to the farm or home. That would be ideal. Use the designated vehicle to go out to the field if you have animals out in the field. And try to wear clean clothing every day or as often as you can. Um, don't borrow disease from your neighbor. Avoid sharing tools and equipment with neighbors. Share equipment, you can also share disease. So before you do so, clean it with Clorox or hydrogen peroxide before you use it in your yard. Don't reuse egg cartons, not worth the risk. Cover up feed and clean spills promptly. This will help keep rodents down as well, but you wanna keep birds away from the feed and um, birds will spread disease to pigs as well. Uh, they may carry uh, one, something called DGE, TGE, which is a serious diarrhea. So, you want to avoid having birds eat uh, feed if possible. So maybe set up uh, bird netting around the feeders to try to keep them away and use rodent bait and dispose of all mortalities promptly. I'm gonna quit with that. These are just more um, resources that we have. Uh, Maryland small ruminant page, Atra. Here's our list serves again. And those uh, aren't used heavily necessarily, I don't think at this point, but I'm not sure. <clears throat> we have a YouTube channel too for University of Minnesota Extension. So there's a small farms YouTube channel, a poultry YouTube channel, and a sheep and goat YouTube channel. And over the last couple of years, We've done a lot of workshops, uh, webinars on different topics related to sheep and goats, and they are really worth watching. Most, many of them are posted, not all of them, but they're all the ones that are up are really good. And I encourage you to go there and um, have a look at those because that there's, especially it's winter time, You've got time in the evening to watch something like those YouTube channel uh, videos. It's well worth it. One last thing I would recommend is if you're thinking about um, exploring an idea on your farm, you may want to apply for a grant. And that uh, you could do through SARE, the North Central Sustainable SARE uh, Agricultural Research and Education Organization, which is it's a US government uh, program part of the US Department of Agriculture and they will fund projects. So talk to them about it. Here's the two people in Minnesota to connect with. And that is it. Call or send an email if you have questions. We will try to find you an answer. Thank you, thank you, thank you.